Good morning. What a special privilege it is to be here on Easter Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So good to see all of you here today. So, so how many of you got an invitation? Oh, that's good. Okay. I guess we're gonna gonna need to get those back from you. No, we're just kidding. <laughs> I'm glad that everybody's here today. Listen, we come here for one reason. We come here to remember what it was that Jesus Christ did, what he came for, what his mission was, and what does that mean for us that have to live from now on uh, without him here on the earth. Uh, let's pray. Father, this morning, we know that you're here. And I thank you for your love and your grace that was so motivated that you would send your only son to die for us to live out his life in a perfect manner, that he was the sinless lamb of God that came for the sins of the world to be sacrificed for me, for us. I thank you, Lord, that what we could never do in and of ourselves by obeying laws and morals, because we're all broken, that you did in sending your son. This morning, Father, it is our deep prayer that you meet with us today, that you speak to our hearts and our minds, that you craft us more into the image of your son, that we might be more like you and less like us. So Lord, guide us as we go through the word. I pray that you might help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. If you've never been here before, you never know what to expect like a box of donuts. Matthew chapter 28 says, but the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. So as we contemplate what it was that Jesus has done for us and the resurrection, we're going we're gonna to take a step back to the crucifixion and remember what it was leading up to this day that Jesus had to endure and go through. And some interesting things, uh, I've selected the text of Matthew. So we're going to look at Matthew's text here, verse 45. Now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. By the way, that's, that's from 12 until six in the middle of the day. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge and they filled it with sour wine and they put it on a reed and they offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let him, let's see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So Matthew gives us what happens at the time of Jesus' death. And of course, we have four authors of a gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all tell a slightly different tale because of their point of view and because of who they were. And if you remember, there's a soldier that actually gets a line in it as well. If you saw the old Jesus film, it was actually John Wayne who looked up in his way and spoke about Jesus. But he gets a line in a bit. Verse 51, and then the moment that he died, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion of those who were with him that were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. Even the centurion guarding 
the proceedings that were going on recognized that Jesus was who he said he was. If you're unaware of what the temple is like, it's this huge place. Inside of it, there's a holy place where the priests would perform sacrifices and light lamps, and there's a remembrance of God's provision with the bread. All of that, but there's this giant veil that's 60 feet high. It's 30 feet wide, and it's an inch thick. There's a recording of them actually putting it up. It took a giant team of horses to lift it into place to put it where it is. So this is not a curtain on your window. This is so that nobody would accidentally trip and fall into the Holy of Holies and be killed instantly because as approaching God's face, and if you don't do it in his way, he guards his holiness that way. And so this veil, which had been a separation between all of the regular people and the very presence of God was torn from top to bottom. Who do you think did that? The veil was what prevented us from having fellowship with God, from it being able to approach the most holy place where the sacrifice was done. Only the high priest would be able to go there only once a year and by blood. He would have to sacrifice blood for his own sin. He would have to make sure he was completely cleansed and he went in and then he sacrificed for the people on behalf of the people. It tore from top to bottom, not a small thing. Isaiah 59, a prophet in the Old Testament says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongue has muttered perversity. Isaiah recognized rightly that we have no right to go before the presence of God. And it's our sin that separates us from God. And that veil was a remembrance of that. And when Jesus died, even as his body broke, it was torn from top to bottom, meaning we can now approach God because through the body of Jesus Christ, we've now been accepted. It was as though the temple had torn its clothes in deep mourning and grief over the death of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, when somebody would die and you were, you know, some of us throw tantrums, some of us kick tires, you know, some of us do that. What they would do is tear their clothes. Clothes were very expensive in those days. And to tear your clothes wasn't a small thing, and it was a sign of what's going on on the inside. And it's as though the temple itself was tearing its clothes in mourning for what was going on with Jesus. In Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 23, it says this, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, or the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, so you see, the New Testament helps us to understand exactly what happened. That veil represented the body of Jesus Christ. But because it was torn, we now have access. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen? So that's what we're told to do. It says that the rocks split. It's rather interesting. There was an earthquake when he died and there was darkness over the earth and the rocks split. It reminds me of the rock in Horeb when Moses went out there and he was told to speak to the rock and that it would give forth water and it split and water came out. And that rock was Jesus. It's a very picture of who Jesus was to be. And it's interesting that Matthew brings up the point that the rocks were split, that the, that the ground itself uh, actually reacted. In 1 Corinthians 10.4, 4, it says, and all drank of the same spiritual drink, meaning in the Old Testament, and they drank of that spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. So the scripture there, again, defines itself and helps us to understand the deeper meaning of those things that happened. It says in Luke 19.39 to 40, and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. If you remember, he was coming into Jerusalem. It was Palm Sunday. They were laying their clothes and palms on the ground and they were worshiping Jesus as the Messiah. And they said, you better tell your disciples to cut it out. They're putting you in a place where you shouldn't be. And Jesus says this, I tell you that if these should be silent, the stones would cry out. 
that somehow if the, if the hard hearts of the crowd don't recognize who Jesus is, the earth does. And it's, it's as though the heart of the earth broke because no one heard the cries of Jesus, that men's hearts were harder than rocks that day, that they didn't understand what was happening. And it says that there was a witness. There was a centurion who was there during all of this. And when he died and the earth shook and the rocks split, that he looked up and he said, truly, this, this man is the son of God. These are his enemies. This is one of the guys that was in charge of putting him up there and putting stakes into his hands and into his feet. One of his men were the ones who went and put the lance right up inside of him, making sure that he was dead. And out came water and blood, says in one of the other gospels. And here's a man that recognizes this, this truly was the son of God. They had come around because it was getting late in the day and they couldn't let them hang there during the Passover. The Jews were very religious about that. Don't want any dead bodies hanging about, although they sentenced him to death. And they went and broke the legs of the men on either side of him, but they came to Jesus and they saw that he was already gone. And so they didn't break his legs, fulfilling a prophecy that not a bone would be broken, that the sacrificial lamb of God, even as the lambs that were brought to the temple and sacrificed, were not to have a bone broken, and so Jesus' bones were not broken. So we have these three witnesses. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there, looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph. By the way, you might know her as Mary the mother of Jesus, but he doesn't put it that way because he had some brothers, James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. If you remember, she was influential to come to Jesus and ask for a special spot for her boys on either side of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. The few and the faithful women who served him in his ministry were the ones who stayed on to the very end. I notice a capacity, and I'm sure I'll get in trouble for this. I'm sure that you recognize that there is a capacity for the heart of a woman to have compassion, more so than a man, unless I'm just projecting the differences between my wife and I on everyone else. <laughs> a mother's heart is something that is much bigger, and these women stayed when they could have been harassed, persecuted, uh, cut down, but they weren't, and they stayed. And there was only one man that we're aware of that stays there, one of his disciples, and it's John, the apostle who's the youngest, who apparently was a teenager and not intimidating to the soldiers. All of the other men fled for their lives, but the women stayed. That's the testimony to a heart that God makes. Now, when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus and then Pilate commanded that the body be given to him. So we've got Joseph of Arimathea, who's an undercover brother. He's on the Jewish Sanhedrin, which means he's a man of prominence and he's wealthy. We're told that he's wealthy. There's another man that's actually with him. Do you remember who it was? Nicodemus. If you remember in chapter three of the book of John, Nick at night, comes to Jesus and has a conversation on the roof and Jesus explains to him who he is. These, these two are undercover brothers, but they're in the Jewish Sanhedrin. These are teachers, premier teachers in Israel, but they're not publicly known. But he's got the guts to be able to come and ask for the body of Jesus and have him buried properly. Otherwise, he would be torn off that cross, left for dead for the animals to eat or sometimes put into a common grave with a bunch of other bodies which was probably nearby. And so he, being a wealthy Jewish man, just before the Sabbath, has to handle a dead body, which, by the way, makes you exempt from being able to worship in the temple. You can't participate in any of the Passover because you're defiled because you touched a dead body. This is before showers and disinfectant and everything else. So there are good reasons for it. But he, along with Nicodemus, take the body down from the cross, which is in itself a traumatic event, 
and have to wrap him. And we're told that he wraps the body in a linen cloth and he lays it out in his own tomb, but I'm getting ahead of myself. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and he laid it in a new tomb in which, had, in which he had hewn out of rock. By the way, he didn't do it by himself. He had people do it because he's a rich man. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. And so these women, some of them went with the body of Jesus, which was not far from where he was crucified, uh, probably the garden tomb, took him and had him wrapped and put him in. And so this was like a marathon burial because the Sabbath was coming. The sun was going down, a new day was to dawn, and they weren't to do any work on the Sabbath. And so these people were hustling to get Jesus out off the cross and inside the tomb and close the door so that nobody would, the animals wouldn't go to the body. And so they didn't embalm him properly. They do that later on. They come with spices to embalm him. But they did it as quickly as they could because the, you know, the time's ticking. And on the next day, by the way, this is the Sabbath day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. By the way, for these men to do this makes them uneligible to participate in any of the activities, but they didn't care. They were very concerned about getting Jesus' body down in time for the Passover, but they themselves didn't care. They went into the place of this Gentile general, and that defiles them all. And they're all chief priests, scribes, Pharisees. These are the people running the show. So as fastidious as they were about this thing, they didn't give a rip about this. And so they come to him, Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. It's amazing. They heard what Jesus said, and his disciples didn't get it. <laughs> Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night, steal him away, and say to the people, he is risen from the dead. And so the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Good thing they did. Because there's absolutely no way that anybody would assume that his disciples came and took him away because there's a Roman guard. And by the way, the guard is not just a guard. A guard is a number of men. It's either between four and 16 men that were guarding this thing. They would seal with ropes across the top of this stone and seal it with wax. And anybody who broke that seal was under the penalty of death. You broke a Roman seal, you lost your life. And so these guys were stationed, I, I can't think of a worse military thing to do, but to guard a corpse. But they thought it was worth doing, so they did it, just so that there wasn't any more trouble. And so now we know a Roman guard is up to 16 soldiers. And what they would do is they would fight back to back so that they'd be able to take on all comers. And that's the way that they can't. So they traveled in a guard. It would be anywhere between four and 16 because they would have to trade people out every four hours. And if you ever got caught sleeping, you lost your life. So you want to stock up on some caffeine. <laughs> now, after the Sabbath on the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And we're told in another gospel that they came bearing all sorts of spices to embalm his body properly. And behold, there was a great earthquake and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Now, I don't know if you've seen Roman guards in pictures or in your imagination, but these guys were treated roughly, much more elite soldiers than what we have today. You know, you, you don't raise a flag and say, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling under pressure now. I think you need to lay off Mr. Drill Sergeant. 
there, there's none of that going on, in the, and, and many people actually would die in training. These guys were taught how to be fierce and bloodthirsty, and they're falling down like children and passing out. They became like dead men. They didn't die, they just, they fainted. Can you imagine a big, strong soldier fainting? I, I wouldn't want that to get around. And so as the Marys are coming, here are the soldiers, and they're guarding this thing, and the angel comes down with an earthquake and just rolls the stone by himself. These things were hundreds of thousands of pounds, rather, and it would take many men to be able to roll this thing into place or roll it out of place. And an angel does it all by himself, and then he sits on it. <laughs> Hello. I love that. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen. As he said, but maybe you don't remember that. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. The angel ends with, Behold, I've told you. It's like, have a nice day. I love that. So the angel gives him the, gives him the news and says, come and see. We're encouraged to come and see the place where Jesus laid. If you ever visit the tomb, you'll note there's no body there. Amen. Muhammad has a place to be buried. Elvis Presley has a place to be buried. Uh, Jim Morrison has a place to be buried. Everybody has a place to be buried except Jesus. There's a place he just borrowed. It was like rented because he's not there. Amen. Now we don't even hear the rest of the story which the other gospels talk about. We see Mary Magdalene goes there at another time and she's weeping and the stone is rolled away. The other women have left. The soldiers have gone into town and there she is and she's weeping at the tomb. This is Mary Magdalene, the one whom seven demons were cast out of, a woman who was known as a prostitute and she, she accepted Jesus for who he was and he changed her life completely. She came to the tomb and he was gone and she was desperately upset that something had been done to his body and somebody took him away. And as she's weeping, she looks inside the tomb and there are two angels. There's one at either end of where Jesus was. And they tell her, he's not here. So apparently the first angel got a buddy and they waited for Mary and they told her. As she's crying, the angels say, why are you weeping? And she says, because they have taken my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. And then she hears a voice from behind her. Woman, why are you weeping? And she says, because they've taken my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. And in her weeping and in her crying, she doesn't even look at the voice. She just assumes he's the gardener. He's the guy watching over the cemetery. And suddenly he says, Mary. And she recognizes it as the voice of Jesus. And there he is. And of course, she turns around, she falls at his feet, she grips him, he goes, oh, oh, oh hold on. You can't hold on to me. He didn't say, don't touch me. He said, don't grip me. You know, you're gripping me. And he explained, you know, go tell Ann Peter. Go tell Ann Peter. I love that, because Peter denied him. Make sure you don't forget about Peter. He's still a disciple. I got plans for him. And so she sees the angels much like what you would find in the Holy of Holies, you would see these two angels over the top of the mercy seat where the blood would be spilled. Picturing the Old Testament that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And James, uh, sorry, Peter and John run and in the book of John chapter 20, he tells us the disciple whom Jesus loved and Peter ran. He doesn't use his own name for what he's gonna about to say. And he says, but the disciple whom Jesus loved ran faster than Peter. So he's humble, but he had to squeak that out, that he had beat Peter. He gets, to the, he gets to the tomb, and he stops, and he peers in, and he sees the clothes there, and he sees the thing that wrapped around his head folded in another place, and he suspected something happened, miraculous. 
Peter came running up, probably like I would, huffing and puffing, and charges into the tomb, doesn't give a rip that there's a dead body or anything. He doesn't, he's not afraid of anything. Runs in, looks around, and he says, the Romans took him. I knew it. But John knew. He was the one who was there, who knew it was Judas that was going to betray. He was the one who was close to Jesus. Jesus kind of had to protect him from Peter and the likes of Peter. So they run in and look, and of course, Jesus is gone, and John suspects a miracle, but Peter thinks the Romans have finally done it in. So we don't get the whole, the whole wide truth from Matthew. Verse 8, so they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. And so they came and held him by the feet. The women just want to hold on to Jesus and worshiped him. And by the way, men nor angels accept worship, only God does. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So Jesus shows up as the women are returning from the tomb and speaks to them and says, go tell my disciples. And of course, Matthew doesn't give us the whole story, but when they get there and they explain it to the men, they just dismissed it as some emotional women. These are some emotional. Hey, you know what? They were the ones that were at the cross when you weren't, pal. But they said, these women, these emotional women, I don't know. Something's going on. But they didn't believe what they said. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled, the elders consulted together. They gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept. Well, that's believable. You got between four and 16 guards and you got this thing sealed with rope and wax. Yeah, sure. His disciples overthrew you guys. You off swords, right? <coughs> so why is it nobody's dead? How come you don't have any bodies for me? <coughs> and if he comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. Uh, by the way, they all would have been killed. And so they took the money and they did as they were instructed and saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. That was the time of the writing of the book of Matthew. And so the religious leaders wanted to cover this thing up and they wanted to make sure nobody knew about it. So they paid off the soldiers. Otherwise, the soldiers would have to go to Pilate and say, yeah, we lost him. Well, you weren't like in hot pursuit of this guy. It's not like, you know, a cops episode or something. He was dead. How do you lose a dead body? Well, just, we will say that his disciples came and stole him and we'll protect you, make sure you don't lose your life. Well, they're getting stationed in Siberia or something at least. But can you imagine trying to explain that? A bunch of full grown men. There was a dude that showed up and we were scared. I soiled myself. I, it was, wasn't good. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. How thick can you be to go through all of this and see the risen body of Jesus Christ with marks on his hands and in his side and in his feet and doubt before you're as critical as I am, how often do I doubt? And I have way more proof than they do. I've got time to pour over the Old Testament and look at the prophecies given. And I've got time to look at everything that Jesus did in the historical records. And I've got lots of proof. And yet sometimes I have doubt. I think it is within our nature to doubt, isn't it? They worshiped him. Only God is to be worshiped, I will remind you. And yet they worshiped him, but some doubted. Remember, Judas went and hung himself. He's gone off the scene, so he's got 11. Some doubted. So if you ever have doubt, you're in good company. Because every one of these guys lost their life 
trusting in Jesus. Some of them assassinated very cruelly. Doubt went away after the second chapter of Acts. But Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So Jesus tells the disciples, I won. It wasn't a failure. The last thing he said on the cross, it is finished. The debt is paid in full. Because I have all power and authority, go and make disciples. That's a very different thing than a convert, isn't it? I would say that the, the Roman soldier that was there looking up the centurion, I think he was a convert. I wonder who made him a disciple. Discipleship involves much more than simple faith. And Jesus says it right here, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. That's what it is to make a disciple. It's to train somebody so that they know how to follow Jesus, not just trust him. And so what does it mean for you and I? Hebrews chapter two, verses 14, 15, and 18 and as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, which means us in our bodies, he himself likewise shared in the same. Jesus was made of the same stuff that you and I are. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Isn't that a great description of humankind? that all of our life, there's this deep fear that I could die at any moment, especially on the Jersey roads. Jesus came to remove the fear of death so that death is no longer an alien thing that we wait for and dread because Jesus experienced death for us. We will all experience physical death unless the Lord comes and takes us home first. But spiritual death, this separation from God, Jesus took upon himself on the cross. That's why he said, why are you so far from my cries? Why have you forsaken me? That's what hell is. It's being forsaken by God. It's crying out to God and getting no answer. And Jesus experienced that for you and me. For in that... He himself has suffered, being tempted. He is able to aid those who are tempted. I'm wondering, how many of you are tempted? I, I'm tempted all the time. It's good. There's more people over here, I notice. You, you're much better people over there. Jesus is the one who helps me to be tempted. That's why I don't... That's why I'm not snorting coke and doing speed and beating people up and robbing houses and stealing cars and... I, I don't do that stuff anymore. Although I could tell you that's the, that's the person I once was. And sometimes I'm tempted to go back to that. Maybe not that far. Maybe it's just resisting a smack that somebody deserves. <laughs> but you should be glad. I'm not like Will Smith. Because I have Jesus and he helps me when I'm tempted to smack you people. <laughs> Should be grateful. Thank God. Thank you, Pastor Dave, for not smacking me when I deserve it. Listen. I, listen, I, I, I don't know what I'm saying. Just, next slide. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians saying, we know because Jesus was risen from the dead that we too who are followers of Jesus Christ will be risen from the dead to be with him. Amen. That is the beauty of what we call the Easter Sunday miracle. It's Jesus Christ resurrected and he offers new life to us if we will trust him, if we will give him our lives, if we'll ask him to be our savior and our Lord, to be the king of our lives, to, you know, you know, he says, 
you know, jump and I just say how high. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses 16 to 18. This is the last scripture for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I just did it. We should comfort one another with these words. I want to thank you guys for coming. I pray that the resurrection of Jesus Christ would find itself alive in you, that you would live out the resurrection of Jesus Christ in your life. Jesus has come and gone, and we're still here. And as long as it's called today, we still have today. You can live for Jesus today with the joy and the hope that Jesus gives because of the resurrection. God bless you guys. Mm -hmm.